Battle Dress by Amy Efa, Chapter 12, Thursday, 5th August, 0810. After breakfast, four bus-sized army trucks were lined up to haul H Company to the gas tent. Cadet Black was standing at the rear of one of them. Get your motivated selves up to this deuce and a half, third platoon, and mount up, Cadet Black yelled. It's a good morning to die. These guys are real original, Gabrielle whispered. If I hear that line one more time, hey, you know the deal, Ping whispered back. Repetition aids learning. I clutched my barracks bag containing my mop suit and said nothing. They seemed so casual about this. I couldn't even pretend to be. Two lines, third platoon. First and second squads on the left, third and fourth on the right. Move out! We double timed to the rear of the truck and stood close together in line. Mixed into the odor of sweaty bodies and morning breath was the smell of diesel and dirt that clung to the huge piece of canvas, forming the truck's sides and roof behind its cab. I hope the gas isn't as bad as the stench. I'd like to put my mask on now. We clambered aboard one after the other. Two long benches faced each other from either side of the truck. I squeezed next to Jason, placing the butt of my weapon and barracks bag on the floor between my feet. Pink took the spot on my left. I listened to the new cadets from first and second squads sitting on the other bench across from me. This is gonna suck. Nah, cops use tear gas all the time. Is that all it is, tear gas? Well, I'm not breathing it. I'm holding my breath. Yeah, so what's gonna keep it out of your eyes? When all of 3rd Platoon was inside, Captain Black slammed the tailgate shut. The motor started up, and we were off. The truck bounced over the surface of the road and jerked whenever the driver shifted gears, causing us to rock against each other like passengers on a crowded subway car. The roar of the motor, our dreaded destination, and insufficient sleep created an overwhelming combination. New cadets started nodding off, their chins resting on their chests. Soon, the grits I had eaten for breakfast settled in my stomach, and resting the bill of my Kevlar on the muzzle of my weapon, I, too, fell asleep. The truck jerked to a halt. I awoke with a start. Cadet Black opened the tailgate and hustled us out of the truck and into a clearing of sun-fried grass surrounded by trees. Standing in the far corner of the clearing, a large tent waited. The gas tent. The grits in my stomach became one hard lump. Okay, H Company, First Sergeant Stockholm said, after we all lined up in a semicircle around him in the grass. Listen up. Today is the culmination of all that NBC training you've had this summer, and especially the skills you learned yesterday. Today you will understand why we had you out here yesterday running between stations in the woods, wearing your mop suits in 99 degree heat, looking like packs of camouflaged Darth Vaders. Laughter rippled around the semicircle, but First Sergeant Stockwell didn't smile. After today, hardcore, NBC will mean more to you than some TV network that broadcasts sitcoms and soap operas. After today, hardcore, nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare will be permanently etched in your minds. Today, hardcore, is a day that I hope you will file away in your hard drives as one of your worst. He scanned the semicircle with narrowed eyes behind the wire-framed glasses. And your best. Worst because you will see what havoc relatively harmless gas can do to your body, and best because you will gain confidence in your equipment. Today, your mop suit and protective mask will become something more to you than a bad Halloween costume. All was quiet around the semicircle. I chewed on my thumbnail and glanced over at the tent at the far end of the site. Two upperclassmen in mop suits and gas masks emerged and walked toward one of the deuce and a halfs. And then a Humvee with a red cross painted on its sides pulled into the site. I looked at Ping. He grinned at me and mouthed the word, medics. It sure boosted my confidence to see them here. Before First Sergeant Stockwell broke the company down into squads for the training, he told us what to expect. First, our squad leaders would test us on donning our mop suits and gas masks. And then the moment we'd all been dreading would come. We'd file through the gas tent and take one deep breath. Cadet Daly collected us from the semicircle and led us to a copse of trees in a far corner of the training site, then remained standing while he had us sit on the ground around him. Eloquent speech out of Cadet Stockel, Cadet Daly said. Reminded me of myself. Hope you took it to heart. He paced back and forth before us, rubbing the back of his neck. Okay, third squad, let's get that blood pumping through your cerebral tissue. What does the acronym of MOP stand for? He stopped in front of Kit. Bogus? Sir, MOP stands for Mission Oriented Protective Posture. All right, you knuckleheads are more awake than you look. And what about MOP levels? Why do we have them? Zero, you're up. Sierra paused a moment before he spoke. Sir, the MOP levels determine what equipment soldiers must wear depending on the chemical threat. Sir, there are five MOP levels. Zero through four. Sir, the MOP equipment consists of... Cadet Daly put his hand up. Cease work there, motivated trooper. You're getting ahead of me. He turned to Gabrielle and smirked. Why don't you finish where Zero left off, Miss Brian? Gabrielle's head shot up. She had been nodding off. Sir, I do not understand. Zoning out there, Brian? Cadet Daly shook his head. Stay alert, stay alive, soldier. Dig her out, Hickman. Hickman imitated Cadet Daly's smirk, and with the voice of a bored state trooper from somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line, he said, Sir, 
The mop equipment consists of an overgarment, jacket, and trousers, over boots and gloves, and an M40 series protective mask with hood. Cadet Daly crouched until he and Hickman locked eyes. Smirk off, Hickman. I don't know who you think you are, pal, but you are not that person. He leaned closer and said through clenched teeth, You got a problem coming to the aid of your squad mate here? He pointed at Gabrielle. No, sir, Hickman answered quickly. Yes. I knew Gabrielle should have been more alert, but Hickman's attitude sucked, and now Cadet Daly let the whole squad know it. Cadet Daly slowly rose to his feet. I didn't think so, Hickman. Moving right along. He stepped past me. Phew. Banano, let's just cut to the chase. What's mop four? Because that's what you'll be wearing today. He looked at his watch. And don't take all day. Banano nodded. Yes, sir. Mop four is when you wear all of your mop gear because you know you've been gassed. That was inelegant, Banano, but accurate. Now third squad, on your feet! We jumped to our feet. I knew what was coming next. Okay, get ready. Like a gunslinger about to go for a six-shooter, I inched my left hand up my thigh toward the gas mask pouch on my hip. You know the drill, Cadet Daly yelled. You have nine seconds to don and clear your protective mask. Gas! 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 I took in a gulp of air, released my chin strap. Cease work! Cadet Daly roared. Hold it right there, third squad. I froze, my hand still on my helmet's chin strap. A number of you no-goed before you even got your masks out of your carriers. What did you do this morning, third squad? OD on stupid juice? His eyes lingered on each of us as they traveled around the circle. The last thing you want to do, third squad, is suck in a huge amount of air when someone yells gas. You stop breathing, period. Do you hear me? Because if you don't, you might never get your mask out of its carrier, and you'll be nothing but a blue hunk of twitching human flesh waiting to be crammed into a body bag. He paused, rubbing the back of his neck. I'm not being melodramatic, third squad. You are training for combat, and when the smoke from the battlefield is lifted and the carnage is revealed, you will find yourself in either one of two states. Alive, he looked up at us, or dead. And a dead lieutenant isn't much use to his troops. Dead. I tried to picture myself dead on some faraway battlefield with other dead all around me. And surprisingly, the thought didn't really scare me much. I only hoped that my death wouldn't be caused by some stupid thing that I had did. I wanted the minister at my funeral to say I'd been brave. I wondered how my family would feel when the military bugler played taps. Would my mother cry? All right, third squad. Cadet Daly clapped his hands together. As you were. I noticed that my fingers were still clutching my chin strap. I slowly lowered my hand to my side. Let's do it right this time. You've got nine seconds. Cadet Daly yelled again. Gas! 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 This time I held my breath, released my chin strap, and dropped my Kevlar to the ground with the others. With my left hand, I yanked open my gas mask pouch and pulled the mask out with my right. Seven seconds! I held the rubber face piece with both hands, checked the hood and harness. Okay. Hood hanging down, harness up. Jammed my chin into the chin pocket. Pulled the harness up over my head. Five. What's going on? The mask wouldn't fit. I struggled with the elastic harness, but the mask was too tight. Something hard pressed against my cheekbones. I yanked my mask off my face and looked inside. Nothing. My hands shook. Oh, what's wrong? Three. I glanced at the others. Some were still clearing their masks, but everyone was wearing them, except me. Two. One. Cease work. We snapped our hands to our sides. The hood from my mask, which was still in my hand, dangled in the dirt. Cadet Daly slowly made his way around the circle, checking masks. Go meant pass, and no go meant fail. And so far, he was giving out all goes. Then he stopped in front of me. One of these smacks is not like the others, he sang softly. One of these smacks just doesn't belong. He leaned closer and whispered, You forgot to remove your glasses, Davis. I winced. I'm such an idiot. That's what was wrong. I'd been so used to wearing contacts, I forgot I was wearing Ted's. When I tested you on this yesterday, Davis, you gotta go, right? Yes, sir. So I assume the only reason you failed to do something as elementary as removing your glasses today was because you had contacts in yesterday, correct? Yes, sir. I stared at the place between his eyebrows. Calm down. It's a stupid mistake. So you aren't perfect. It's not the end of the world. So continuing with this line of reasoning, Davis, since you were not accustomed to removing your glasses when donning your mask today, you forgot. In other words, you had a major brain cramp, correct? Y yes, sir. I bit the inside of my lip and braced myself for the coming explosion. He stared at me for a long time. Okay, Davis, he finally said. Put your mask back in the carrier. Let me check the rest of these guys and then I'll retest you. All right? Yes, sir. I almost smiled. As he walked away, he said, Just make sure you put your inserts in right or you won't get a good seal. And you'll be a no-go again. Inserts? Yes, sir. I squeaked, my brain working double time. What in the world are inserts? Think. All clear, Cadet Daly yelled. Everyone, except me, tore off their masks and wiped their sweaty faces on their sleeves. Return your mask to your carriers and get your Kevlars to your heads. In a few minutes, I'll give the signal for gas again. This time, you're going to don all your mop gear. 
This is the standard third squad. You must go from mop zero to four in eight minutes. You will don your mask first, and then the rest of your gear. In this order. Trousers, jacket, boots, gloves. Got it? Yes, sir! I folded the hood around the mask and stuffed it inside my carrier. Mop four. Eight minutes. Mask, trousers, jacket, boots, gloves. Got it? Make sure everything is snapped, zipped, and tied, or you'll no-go. I know putting your mask on first will make life difficult, third squad, but hey, that's the way it'll be when the balloon goes up, so get used to it. He checked his watch. I highly suggest you organize your gear on the ground in front of you. You've got three minutes. Work! I emptied my barracks bag and worked on arranging my mop gear on the ground. Gloves under boots, under jacket, under trousers. Cadet Daly stood over me. Davis, he said quietly, listen. I'm just going to retest you under your mask at the same time I test these other guys on Mop 4. After you don your mask, if you pass, continue on with the rest of your mop gear, with everybody else. Understand? I looked up at him, relieved. Yes, sir. He nodded and walked away. Cadet Daly can be pretty cool. Sometimes. Maybe nobody even noticed that I no-goed. It was pretty hard to see out of the masks. I chewed on the inside of my lip, watching the others stack their gear in neat piles. But I've got to find out about those inserts. I just couldn't no-go again. Not after Cadet Daly had cut me that break. I glanced at Hickman on my right, then at Banano on my left. Between the two of them, I figured Hickman would be more likely to know. Oh, why couldn't Kit be next to me? Or Ping? I closed my eyes. Oh, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. I turned to Hickman and whispered, Hey, Tommy. Yeah? Hey, do you have any idea what inserts are? Do they have something to do with the filters? Hickman stopped stacking his mop gear and stared at me. So you know, Goad? It was a statement, not a question. I made my pile neater. Well, yeah, I am... Um, Sort of forgot to take off my glasses when I donned my mask. You didn't have to tell him that. Hickman sighed. Look, Davis, if you got issued TEDs, you got issued inserts. People that need glasses put prescription inserts into their masks so when they take off their glasses and put on their masks, they can see. He shook his head. They went over all this yesterday. Oh, I managed a fake laugh. Well, I guess I really didn't pay attention since I normally wear contacts. Hickman did not look interested. So, inserts are those weird-looking glasses things... With the wires on the ends that came with my TEDs, huh? Before my lips had finished forming the words, I had already figured out the answer to my question. And I cringed inside. I'd packed away those weird-looking glasses, things, with the wires on the ends in MacArthur's barracks basement, with the rest of my stuff. What an idiot. I had thought they were a replacement set of lenses for my TEDs in case the originals ever broke. Hickman shrugged. I have no idea what they look like, Andy. I don't need glasses. I smiled, trying to play the whole thing off as if it were no big deal. Well, thanks for the info. I turned away from him and gnawed on my fingernails, one after the other. What am I going to do? I can't see without glasses. Or inserts. Oh, Gabrielle was right. I should have worn my contacts. Cadet Daly's gonna kill me. Gas! 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 Cadet Daly suddenly yelled. He was moving toward me. Oh well, it's a good morning to die. Eight minutes, third squad. Cadet Daly nodded at me. Starting now. Here goes. I held my breath and dropped my Kevlar to the ground. Glasses. I pulled off my Teds and shoved them into the cargo pocket of my pants. The world was now a blur of browns and greens. I reached for my gas mask. Okay, just act like you can see. He'll never guess you don't have inserts. Seven seconds! Somehow, by the time Cadet Daly said, Cease work, Davis. The nine seconds were spent, and I had donned and cleared my mask. Cadet Daly moved closer and checked it. Then he thumped me on top of my head. You're a go, Davis. Drive on. I did it. Thank God. I pulled the hood over my head. Then I unbuckled my LCE and shrugged it off, letting it drop to the ground. I stumbled to my pile of mop gear and snatched what I hoped were trousers off the top, holding them close to my face. Pants. So far, so good. I struggled to get them over my combat boots. Now the jacket. Sweat trickled down my neck and steam from my face fogged my mask, further blurring my vision. I took my time with the jacket, making sure I didn't mismatch the snaps. By the time I finished, I felt like I was standing in a sauna dressed in a triple thick sweatsuit with a plastic bag over my head. You're at four minutes, third squad, Cadet Daly yelled. Now the overboots. I bent over, hard to do with so much on, and, like a drunk trying to fit a key into a lock, I fumbled those floppy one-size-fits-all rubber boots over my combat boots. Lacing the overboots was even worse. Looping the laces through this eyelet and back through that one, inside to outside, letting my fingers do the seeing since my eyes couldn't. 30 seconds remaining! Only 30 seconds? I looked up. I didn't see much movement in the haze. Great. Is everyone done already? I dropped to my hands and knees, groping the ground for my gloves. Oh, come on. Where are they? Squinting didn't help. Okay, just calm down. You'll find them. My fingertips touched rubber. Yes. I scrambled to my feet and pulled my gloves over my hands. Then I slapped my Kevlar on my head. Done. Five, four, three, two, one. Cease work, Cadet Daly yelled. Okay, third squad, let's see how you did. Cadet Daly traveled around the circle until he reached me. I think I'll start with you, Davis. He looked me over from foot to head. 
then step behind me. May I touch you? Something's wrong. Yes, sir, I yelled through my mask. Please don't say I'm a no-go again, please. I felt him tugging at the bottom of my mop jacket. You failed to snap one of the three snaps that connect your jacket to your trousers. I wanted to clobber myself. Idiot. But I'm a reasonable guy, Davis, so I'm going to make a deal with you. You make the correction in five seconds since you had five seconds to spare, and you're a go. If you don't, he smacked his lips. I guess Third Squad will get to see your encore performance of, he now stood facing me, Blind Man's Bluff. He knows. He definitely knows. I was thankful for my mask just then. I held my breath. Okay, go ahead. Haze me. I deserve it. Make the correction. I stood there, shocked that he had shown me mercy for the second time today. Who are you, Davis? Helen Keller? I said make the correction. Yes, sir. I found the snaps along the back hem of my jacket and made the correction before he changed his mind. When I looked up, Cadet Daly was gone. He had moved on to Hickman, and I was amused to hear was correcting him for the same mistake that I had made. After he had inspected us, Cadet Daly said, Okay, third squad, let's get those pores opened up and those lungs cranking. I want you to get the full benefit of today's training. Double time in place. Ready? Begin. He made us run in place. He led us through 50 repetitions of the side straddle hop. He made us run in place. He dropped us for push-ups. He made us run in place. Bring those knees to your chest, third squad. What's the matter? You stay up all night or something? Put a little pep in your step. Pep in my step? I felt like I was slogging through wet concrete up to my waist, and I was unbelievably hot. Looks like third platoon's in the door, third squad. Cadet Daly said, pointing across the site toward the tent. See? First squad's going in. Right? Now. I peered out of my mass fogged over eyepieces, seeing nothing. And second squad's standing by. It's time for you to join the fray. Put on your LCEs and line up behind Hickman. Then double time over to the tent. Quickly. I felt the ground around me with my feet for my LCE until I kicked it. I snatched it up and jumped behind Hickman. I fumbled with my LCE, untwisting its suspenders and snapping its buckle. I tried to catch my breath as the rest of third squad pushed and stumbled their way into a single file line. What are you waiting for, Hickman? Cadet Daly yelled. An engraved invitation? Move out! I jogged behind Hickman, squinting at the ground, its grounds and greens rushing over my feet like a treadmill. Just don't trip. Keep moving. But whatever you do, just don't trip. I heard a lot of yelling as we neared the olive drab blur that was the tent. I squinted. On one side, I could make out a line of new cadets shuffling in. On the other side, new cadets staggered out, their masks in their hands and their arms flailing. Upperclassmen holding canteens had formed a sort of corridor just outside the exit, greeting the new cadets with faces full of water as they burst outside. Come on, keep the line moving, new cadets. Oh yeah, it's a good day to be a soldier. hoo The scene wasn't a pleasant one. I don't want to do this. Veer to the left of the tent, boneheads, yelled an upperclassman. Double time in a circle. I don't want you resting while you wait. Hickman curved us to the left, and soon third squad was trotting around and around like circus elephants. Keep moving, new cadets, the upperclassman yelled. I tripped along beside Hickman for what seemed like forever. Okay, you. The upperclassman grabbed my arm and shoved me toward the tent. Go on inside. The rest of you follow him. Follow him? For a moment, I was confused. He did mean for me to go in first, didn't he? Then I realized. Mop suits made us sexless. I stepped forward and batted the canvas with my hands. Oh, come on. Where's the stupid door flap? A third squad member banged into me from behind, and I was inside. I blinked, trying to adjust the little sight I had to the dimness. My chest rose and fell, and my ears filled with the sound of my own breath. Well, this is it. No turning back now. Don't just stand there, dipwad. I snapped my head in the direction of another blur, an upperclassman standing in the center of the tent. He was dressed in mop four, waving me in. I stumbled forward, running my rubber-gloved hand along the wall of the tent to guide me. The rest of third squad crept inside like they were expecting a ghost to pop out at them. Hustle it up, new cadets. What are you waiting for? Christmas? Let's go. My old granny moves faster than you. I took cautious, shallow breaths. Okay, this isn't going to be that bad. It's really hot in here, but... Welcome to my humble abode, new cadets, the upperclassman said. His voice came out slightly muffled through his mask, as if he were speaking with a hand clamped over his mouth. Anyone feel a burning sensation? Or smell something like burned rubber being shoved up your nose? He paused. No? Good. Looks like everyone has a good seal. Believe me, you'd know it otherwise. I took another breath. No burning, no smell. Good seal. Relax. This isn't so bad. Now when I say all clear, you will remove your masks. I squinted over at the exit, judging the distance. Okay, just hold your breath till he says we can go. You can swim the length of a 50 meter pool without coming up for air. You can do this. And immediately begin reciting the national anthem, starting with the second verse, loud and in a motivated manner. The national anthem? Reciting it wasn't a problem. I knew it. It had been part of week two's knowledge. Reciting while holding my breath, however, was a problem. But I do it. Somehow. For those of you who got hippopotamus lungs and think you can hold out on me, think again. 
I'm a very patriotic guy. I love the national anthem. So if you make it through the second verse, keep on going and recite the first verse. Because your only ticket out of here is that coffin sound, understand? I was going to have to breathe the stuff. Yes, sir! He paused. I waited with the others. One breath, two breaths, three breaths. All clear! I gulped, filling my lungs with air, then pulled off my mask. The fiery slap that hit me in the face almost made me suck in again. Together, we started to chant the second verse of the national anthem at triple speed. Oh, this be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes in wild war's desolation. Blessed be the victory and peace. My face burned and itched like it did whenever I'd come into my house after running in a sub-zero wind chill, but much worse. Suddenly, someone tall doubled over and whipped around for the exit. Was that Kit? Gone already? May the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and another fled. Preserved us as a nation, then conquer we must, when our cause it is just. Another bolted, the smallest person in the tent. Gabrielle staggered after him, clawing at her eyes. Don't look. I squeezed my eyes shut. They were starting to tear. Snot leaked out of my nose, ran down my chin. Hold on. I really did not want to breathe that stuff. And this be our motto, in God we trust, in the star-spangled banner. I opened my eyes. Besides the upperclassmen, only one other person and I remained. He was huge. Zero? I was reaching my limit. My air was almost gone. In triumph shall wave. I clenched my fists. Blood pounded against the inside of my skull. Or the land of the free and the home? No. I had taken a breath during the natural pause of the verse, just like I would have if I had been singing. Dry, scratchy air, like super concentrated car exhaust, rushed in. Mucus spewed out. I sucked in again. I'm drowning. No, my throat's on fire. I wasn't in an army tent. I was in an airtight phone booth with a thousand chopped onions. I scrambled for the exit and, waving my arms wildly in front of me, found the opening in the canvas. Of the brave. Zero had finished the verse. Alone. Sunlight and cold water struck my eyes simultaneously. Shouting faces hovered above me. Hands pushed me forward. Water drenched my hair, my face, my neck. Keep moving forward, Davis. You're doing okay. No stalling. Someone's right behind you. More snot than I ever imagined my body could produce covered my face in mop suit. Thick lines of drool hung from my mouth to my waist. No sunburn, not even the one I got on my first day of life guarding two summers ago, had ever fried my face like this. I bent over and coughed until I was sure I'd see foamy chunks of lung fly out of my mouth. Someone's hand came down on my shoulder, hard. I reeled around. Zero. His eyes were red, his face covered with slime, his mop jacket dripped water and goo. Davis, just want to say... He turned away from me and spewed mucus out of his mouth. I just wanted to say, I'm glad you left when you did. I couldn't. He started coughing, then cleared his throat and spat again. Hold out. Much longer. He wiped his nose on his sleeve. Man, that stings. That mop suit really soaked up that stuff. I shook my head. Hold out. Much longer? My words came out in wheezy gasps. Yeah, he held his mask under his arm and peeled off his gloves. I just wanted to be the last guy out of the tent, that's all. He paused to take three raspy breaths. You know, to really experience the stuff. Experience the stuff, Ciro. I shook my head again. Not me. I just didn't want to inhale. That's why I stayed in so long. I coughed, then swallowed. Coughed, then swallowed. And finally spat. Procrastination, I guess. Man, I thought you guys were- Man, I thought you guys would never come out of that fiery furnace. I turned around. Kit was standing behind me, a canteen in his hand. I was starting to think you were doing a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A what? I squinted at Kit and started coughing again. Kit, sometimes I think you belong on another planet or something. I wiped my mouth on my shoulder. Ouch. My lips burned like I had smeared them with Tabasco sauce. Kit winked. What can I say? I'm just a pilgrim traveling through. Here. He handed me his canteen. You look like you need a drink. I took a swig, swishing the water around my mouth before I swallowed. Sorry, but I think the gas has affected both your brains, guys. Me? Kit wheezed a laugh. I wasn't in there long enough, Andy. I took my obligatory breath and I was out of there. I figured why prolong the misery. But this guy, he pointed at Ciro, just admitted that he wanted to experience the gas. Now tell me who's killed some serious brain cells. Ciro opened his mouth to say something, then just smiled and shook his head. You've got a point there, Kit. I reached down between my mop pants and my BDU trousers, feeling for the cargo pocket that held my glasses. All I can say is you guys are way more hoo than me. Kit shrugged. hoo probably isn't the right word, Bogus. He glanced at me. I'm speaking for myself, of course. Sentimental would be more accurate, I think. Sentimental? Kit and I said together. I slid my tads on my face. Finally, I've got my eyes back. Ciro frowned. Okay, now I do sound like my brain's been affected. Forget I mentioned it. 
He scanned the pack of slime-covered, hacking new cadets who were milling around all over the training site. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to shed these threads. Where's third squad at? I'm the guy to ask, Kit said. I just came from there to police you two up. Then he looked at me. And I'll tell you what, Andy. Gab's one unhappy camper right now. I felt my heart speed up. Why, what happened? She's okay, isn't she? Oh, she's okay, Kit said. But she wore her contacts today, and she lost them. Kit nodded. I shook my head. Poor Gab. These past 24 hours had been rough ones for her. As we made our way over to third squad, Kit said, Okay, Ciro, I'm not letting you off the hook. You can't just say something like, CS gas makes me feel sentimental and drop it. Ciro flexed his jaw and stared straight ahead. I nudged him. Yeah, that's right, Ciro. There's nothing sentimental about coughing your guts out. Ciro slowed his steps, then stopped completely. His eyes bounced between my face and Kit's. Look, guys, he finally said. It's no enigma, okay? It's just that, well, tear gas and my family go way back, that's all. He glared at us. It's not a joke, guys. Kit stared back at him. You see us laughing, Ciro? Ciro stared at the toe of his boot, kicking a stone that was stuck in the dirt. Look, when my grandma was about my age, she got a good dose of tear gas. My uncle, too. Same age. Same town. 27 years later. End of story. Oh, so they were in the army, too? I don't know why exactly, but I regretted the question the second I asked it. I started pulling off my gloves to give me something to do. Not exactly. Not unless... Sierra said, dropping his voice, as if he were talking more to himself than to me. You think the color of your skin is some sort of uniform. Then he looked at us, his eyes guarded. No, during the Watts riots, 1965, and the Rodney riots, 1992, respectively. He crossed his arms. LA's the place to be if you want to get gassed. I didn't know how to respond to that, and apparently neither did Kit, because we said nothing together. Nope, my family's no fan of the army, Sierra said. Or West Point, for that matter. He shook his head and laughed softly. Definitely not West Point. He let out a long, tired breath. My grandma's the toughest lady you'll ever meet. She raised me and my brothers when my mom took off. But back when she was my age, she had two passions, anti-war protests and civil rights, and she's never let them go. For as long as I remember, she's combined the two in hating the military. He paused. Her first husband was a KIA in Vietnam. Killed in action. Sorry. I chewed on my thumbnail. It tasted like burnt rubber. Yeah. Ciro stooped down to pick up the stone. He had been working it out of the dirt all this time, then tossed it from one hand to the other, one hand to the other. She's always going around saying stuff like Vietnam was the black man's war and quoting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He clenched his fist over the stone and closed his eyes. Lines creased his forehead. We have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together in brutal solidarity, realizing that they would never live on the same block in Detroit. He opened his eyes. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, my grandma has his speeches memorized like preachers know the gospels. He shrugged, his eyes wary again. But hey, this means nothing to you guys. You don't want to hear this. I looked back at the tent. Mass pandemonium still encircled it. No, Ciro. It's really great, because today you got to carry out the family tradition. It didn't happen during a riot. I nodded at the tent. Exactly. But it is the sixth week of feast, you know. That should count for something. I smiled, hoping that this time I had said the right thing. A little spark flashed in his eyes, and I knew I had. That's right, Kit said. You got your own square on the old family quilt now. What a cool thing to say. Yeah. Ciro turned toward Kit, a grin creeping across his face. Yeah, a square on my old family quilt. Hey, that's good, Bogus. I like that. He paused, watching the side of his face. You know, I haven't written my grandma all summer except when Cadet Daly told us to, of course. But now I think I've got something to write home about. Something she can relate to. Maybe she'll finally see that, well, we all have our causes. He chucked the stone toward the woods. Mine's making it through this place. East LA ain't gonna be my cage. We watched the stone sail through the air, then hit a branch before bouncing off the leaves as it dropped to the ground. Well, Ciro, I said, when you write her, tell her about us. I nodded my head toward Kit. Tell her that we live on the same hallway as you, okay? I will, he nodded. I want her to know that. Ciro clapped us both on the back. Thanks, guys. Then he squared his shoulders and the hardness was back in his eyes. Just like that. Nuff said. Let's hook up with Third Squad. They're waiting on us. As I sat with Third Squad in the copse of trees, peeling off my soggy mop suit and listening to Gabrielle's requiem for her lost contact lenses, I felt like a real human being for the first time all summer. For a few minutes, Ciro had cracked open his onyx exterior and let me see inside, and I realized that I wasn't the only one with a quilt square to stitch.